video series, 15 Minutes with the Transport Professional. I'm Erin De Silva, Head of Student Outreach and the Young Members Portfolio for the Division. Today we are kicking off the series with a chat with a public transport planning professional and we are privileged to have Peter Ondewatu from uh, Hatch, who is a public transport specialist. Thank you so much, Peter, for joining us today. Peter, can you please provide us with a background of your career in public transport planning? Yeah, um, yeah. Let, let me introduce myself. Peter Onderwater, um, um, I am a civil engineer. Um, at least I studied uh, civil engineering, uh, what is it, about 30, 40 years ago um, in Delft. Um, and Delft is not the township in Cape Town. Delft is, is a quite renowned uh, university in the Netherlands. Uh, and the first, what is it, 20 years of my work and career, I was in the Netherlands. Um, I moved to South Africa about 10 years ago and immediately decided not to go back anymore. Uh, there, there's so much to do here in South Africa. My skills are so much needed. Um, so I, I decided to, to stay here. Um, as I said, civil engineer by education, but I'm, I'm a public transport planner. Um, I hardly consider myself a civil engineer anymore, although I am extra registered and uh, etc. But um, I'm a tra public transport planner, sometimes a transport economist. Sometimes I feel myself a transport sociologist. Um, I'm, I'm a part time land use planner um, and sometimes even a transportation planner. And, and transportation engineer, uh, but it, you need to have all these skills to be an expert in public transport planning. It's not just uh, civil engineering. So, Peter, yeah, you've brought in quite a few different disciplines uh, just from your opening statements, and I think one thing we need to understand is what entails being a public transport planner. Yeah, well, as, as the words say, you plan for public transport uh, to provide it public transport and it is it is service, it's operations and it's infrastructure. Uh, that that is what what public transport is. Uh, OK, you're not providing public transport itself. That's what the rail companies and the taxi drivers uh, do, but you plan for it. And I always plan for, uh, and keep in mind two different markets for which I'm planning. And the one market is the people that don't have private transport, but they still need to go to work, to shops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We call them the captive users. Uh, and the second market is to provide uh, a very good alternative to that private transport, uh, and that is for the choice users. But you're not really planning public transport for the sake of public transport. It is for those people to take part in, in social life and economic activities. Um, and, and you try to do that with the least burden on environment and the least burden on your financial uh, budgets. Um, but, but all in all, in the end, it is about making cities work. Uh, it's, it's about uh, facilitating local and national economy. And, and in the end, it is about making people happy. That, that's what I like to do. OK, great. So just looking at that, uh, what would you say the principles are of public transport planning? Um, look, many, many engineers, they, they start with uh, what are the requirements for my design? Um, uh, what are the principles for design? Um, I, I would like to start somewhere different. And maybe maybe if I can draw up a scheme and, and share my screen uh, with you. Uh, if that works. Quick enough. My screen is visible. Yeah. Here? yeah. Yes, um, it is. What I start normally uh, is with, um, with with the public transport uh, quality. What quality does the public transport uh, network require? What does the passenger require? Uh, because that will very much determine whether a public transport, whether, whether a passenger will make use of public transport or not. And, and that together with your whole urban setting and your urban planning, together with that, the qualities and the quantities will determine your passenger market. And uh, once you know your passenger market, then you could use a traffic and a transport model uh, to do so, but that's a whole different uh, expertise on, in modeling. But once you do have your uh, knowledge of your passenger market, then you can start designing a network and with a level of service that uh, that accommodates that um, the, the quality needs. And that network um, has to be operated by an operator. 
uh, and for such an operator to make a, um, a viable operations, he will make a business case for this operation. So it's 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 also an economic assessment. And um, once you have that network, you you might need additional infrastructure. If the, the current infrastructure is not sufficient, you might need additional infrastructure. And then the real engineers come into play. Um, but before you decide on that infrastructure, you also make a cost benefit analysis. And there uh, it's again uh, an economic financial assessment. Um, how does it work out for society? Can I afford that piece of infrastructure or not? So it's also very much about uh, economy, financial and economic uh, planning, uh, both for the individual, the passenger, what do I want? When do I want to make use of public transport? When not? It's the economy assessment for, an op for the company, the operator, what is a good business case? And it's the national economic assessment. Uh, where do I put my money? Do I put it in, in rail or in road infrastructure or in health or in education? Uh, and there's, there's a huge uh, alignment with urban planning and also with urban development. Uh, so first of all, it does uh, point out where are my passengers, where they want to go, what is the passenger market? But there's another interesting thing that if you have a good public transport network, it will also create planning and urban development. And that's what we call transit oriented development. And obviously, if you need infrastructure, it has to fit within that urban pattern. So it is, there's a huge uh, alignment with urban planning and, and transportation planning. And the foundation of that all, the bottom of this whole framework, isn't policy and governance in the organization. Um, who is responsible for what and, and what do we want to achieve with, uh, with public transport? So this is kind of a one page framework, and, and I use that in all of my work. And I always assess where in my framework am I? Am I currently a transport planner or an urban planner? Or am I more an economist uh, assessing uh, the value of public transport? So this, this is kind of the principle for, for public transport. So it's not only civil engineering. Yes, it does uh, help. It's also economy, it's urban planning, it's, it's cultural and governance, it's so much more. So I think you've sort of opened up maybe a, a kind of can of worms here. And I think this question might be um, quite beneficial after that side is what are the challenges that you find are associated with public transport planning? I mean, you spoke about, you know, knowing, um, you know, the culture of the people that you obviously have to move. You spoke about the legislation. So are there challenges regarding legislation, the economy? What are the biggest challenges that you find um, that you have to try and solve? Yeah, well, the, the, there's, there's so many challenges, and I think that is the challenge uh, in itself. Um, everybody is looking for an all-encompassing answer, uh, kind of kind of the golden, uh, the silver bullet uh, to, to solve the problems in one snap with a finger and say, this is the perfect public transport system, let's introduce it, and, uh, and then, we've got solved, then we've solved all our problems. You never can do that. You, you never can achieve that. Um, um, first of all, because there is no silver bullet, um, but the, the, the longer that we study on that silver bullet, circumstances have changed and you need to, to change that silver bullet again and again and again. And I think that is the biggest challenge. Uh, people are waiting for, for the perfect solution um, and forget to, to change some of the current problems. And, and I really do like uh, what they call the Pareto principle, that with 20% of your effort and probably also 20% of your budgets, you can already solve 80% of, uh, of your problems and of your issues. And, and why not start with that? Why not be happy with an 80% solution just to implement it quick, quick, and then later on find uh, the, the budgets and, and the efforts to, to find the perfect solution and add to the last 20%. But unfortunately, and I think that is the main challenge, people, government is waiting for the perfect solution. And while waiting, nothing happens. Um, so so I'd, I'd rather start just changing, improving the situation. And it, it might not be perfect, but it's good enough. And, and let's not wait for that. 
That's really interesting. I like how you sort of bring it in like what the silver bullet is. And I think this question sort of maybe outlines that is like coming from a predominantly developed uh, sort of country within the Netherlands, you know, they have a very good public transport system and stuff like that. You came to South Africa where it isn't quite um, as developed and stuff like that. So have you been in projects that you've sort of taken what you learned from the Netherlands into South Africa that you've sort of tried to apply a bit of an innovative uh, principles to it uh, to try and get our public transport system a bit better? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to contradict a little bit what you're saying. Uh, when I came to South Africa, one of the first projects that I was working on, and it is indeed the project that I'm working on most of my time, is Gau Train. And Gau Train is a world-class public transport, not only in South Africa, but it is worldwide um, um, world-class system. And still, the, the Gau Train Management Agency and, and, and government is trying to improve it further. To, to make it even better than world class. Um, and, and that is very interesting. And that is that is also challenging. Uh, it's also challenging myself uh, as a, an expert in public transport who comes from, uh, I've seen it all, I've done it uh, before. Um, still, there's more to improve. Uh, by the way, that was one of the reasons why I left the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, uh, they thought, yeah, our public transport system is so perfect. We're, we're done, we're finished and clear, we're ready. Um, and I didn't want to wait until my retirement, uh, just sitting uh, uh, and, and seeing how it would unfold. And I still think it's not perfect. It can still be improved. But um, saying that, um, it, it's, it's very nice to work on these uh, world class projects, but the majority of public transport users are sitting in the minibus taxis. They are waiting for Metrorail to come back on track. That is public transport in South Africa, in Africa, and that really requires a lot of uh, improvement. And, and also there, um, it's that same uh, principle of um, um, you, you can start with very simple, small issues um, and, and, and improving the public transport system bit by bit by bit incrementally. Um, unfortunately, many of the projects are silver bullet type of projects. Um, give me the perfect BRT solution, implement it and uh, we're ready. No, it's not like that. Um, uh, e even a, a BRT system, um, it can be implemented step by step by step. Uh, improve the service, improve your provision of information, improve the timetable, improve operations. Um, if there is any congestion uh, along the road, uh, jump that queue with, with a, a small dedicated lane, not the full 30 kilometers of dedicated BRT infrastructure, but step by step by step, improve public transport. And, 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 and I think that's the difference that I see in the, in the European public transport projects. They are cut up in small steps improving this, improving that, trying to do this, do a pilot here, implement it there. While here they ask, what is the silver bullet? And, and I'd, I'd like to start with small, small projects and implement them ASAP so that the passengers can feel the difference. Okay, I, I quite like that, that say you like chop it up into pieces and stuff like that. So I think this question with the either our young graduates or our students looking, you know, to possibly become public transport planners and stuff like that. What would you think, um, you know, maybe it's how they taught or stuff like that. What is the main pitfalls that you feel that young engineers um, or graduates make when they think about public transport planning or they try and get into the field? Um, I, I would say that, that you always have to be critical um, and, and not blindly trust what's in textbooks or in lectures or, or what, what people say that is, uh, is the best uh, silver bullet. And I know I shoot myself in the foot here because I, I, I'm the expert and I like people to listen to me. Uh, I'm also lecturing myself at UCT and at the same time I'm telling you uh, not, to, not to trust what I'm, uh, what I'm teaching you. But I, I do that because I think each and every situation is unique and is different and should be treated uh, differently. Um, so you always have to be critical, always ask yourself, uh, is it indeed like it is, like people tell me? Um, 
and 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 that that is one of the most important advices I would like to give to young engineers and long, and young transport planners. You have to go out there yourself. You have to go on a site visit. You you have to use public transport yourself. Um, open your eyes, look around, talk to passengers, and keep on asking yourself these questions. Is it really good that what what I see? Uh, can it be better? Can it work better? How can I make small improvements? How can I make big improvements? Um, and, and you always have to ask yourself questions, uh, always doubt yourself and, and doubt the experts in a, in a positive way. Um, let me give you an example. I've, uh, about five, six years ago in a previous uh, career, I've, I've mentored a couple of, of juniors on, on several public transport projects and, and they were all all here in Durban uh, where I live and where I worked. And, and I've asked them, have you been there? Have you looked at it? No, 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 no. It's, it's, I'm not going on site. Uh, why, why would I? I can do that. Um, but it don't, was only half an hour away and you could go to that taxi rank and see what's happening. And once you see what's happening, you, you can find a solution much easier than, than from a textbook or from Google Earth or from, from whatever experience that you, you have. And I also invited a lot of colleagues to, to do on a train trip with Metrorail, but these trips hardly ever materialized. Uh, they, they, I don't know, maybe they're scared to do so or they think they, they just work on it themselves. But the very few times that they did go out there, when they went to the, uh, the taxi rank, when they sit in the train, then all of a sudden they had a wealth of, of new experiences, of new uh, expertise, and it really did improve their, uh, their project works. All of a sudden they knew what they were doing and why they were doing it. So I would say, question yourself, question uh, the world, um, uh, go out there and, and have a look yourself and, and see what, what can be changed. So what you're saying is in order to improve something, you've got to be the passenger first. Um. <laughs> I always say, how can you be a marketeer for peanut butter if you don't like peanut butter yourself? Uh, <laughs> you can't be passionate about peanut butter. <laughs> you have to be passionate about the work that you're doing. <laughs> for sure. Uh, Peter, is there anything else that you feel is important for you know people looking to either swap careers into public transport planning or young graduates coming through that that want to get into this field I, I think that is exactly it you have to be passionate um, um and and how do you get passionate passionate um and, and you, you will get passionate because you you have to feel that you're working for society for community for passengers um, and, and that is probably the reason why I do work for public transport uh, and not for freight rail, for instance. While as a civil engineer, I'm, I'm probably, I could even be a good expert in, in, in freight rail provision, but I've never seen a ton of calls smile back to me. But I do want to see passengers smile about my solution. Um, you, you have to remember, um, um, your working career will last you for a lot for the next 40 years. So, so you have to do something that you really like, that you that you can live for for the next 40 years. And and whether that is civil engineering in general, or a public transport planner, or even a taxi driver, you have to be passionate about what you're doing, and and then really enjoy uh, your work and career. Peter, thank you so much for you joining us today. And I think those wise words that you left us with is, you know, really profound. And uh, I think it would resonate with a lot of people. You know, I get that thing to smile back at you, whatever that might be. Um, and, you know, you just keep following that. Uh, so, yeah. Peter, thank you very much. Um, and if we get any questions, I think I'll probably just direct them to you and then we'll find a way to answer them. Perfect. I'm always happy to help uh, society and people and young engineers.